Our ancient ancestor, the pig? Explaining away T-Rex blood and the non-evolution of the plants. This and more on this episode of Genesis Week. Welcome to this episode of Genesis Week, the weekly program of creationary commentary on news, views, and events pertaining to the Origins controversy, made possible by you, the supporters of CORE Ottawa, Citizens for Origins Research and Education. Carried on the Miracle Channel in Canada, the Walk TV in the US, as well as their satellites all around the globe, and of course, the Chris Genema Network on YouTube. Excellence in pirate broadcasting. We set up our studios wherever we can so we can continue to bring you the information the anti-creationists don't want you to see or hear and giving glory to our creator while doing it. Remember, if you get lost in cyberspace, you can just punch in wazulu.com, that's me, or genesisweek.com and you can find us. And don't forget to subscribe to our YouTube channel to keep up to date and catch entire interviews with our guests. I'm your host, Ian Juby. I was overrun by you, my intrepid reporters from around the world, who all sent me an article put out by the British online newspaper, The Mail. Now, I have actually mentioned this theory on a previous episode of Genesis Week, and I'm grateful for so many people sending me the article. I'd rather have dozens of people send me the same report rather than missing a report because no one sent it in. Evolutionary geneticist and hybrid expert, Dr. Eugene McCarthy, has proposed a radical model for the evolution and rise of the human race. He suggests that humans are actually the result of the hybridization of a chimpanzee and the common pig. Yeah, you heard that right. A chimpanzee and a pig had sex, had fertile offspring, which eventually became us. Now, before anyone yells hogwash, especially my evolutionary viewers, it should be noted that he uses evolutionary arguments and uses them well, in fact. This goes to show you just how flexible evolutionism is to conform and mold to any evidence presented to it. Basically, it works like this. The majority of evolutionism evidence is based on various forms of homology, similarities between organisms. Now, those similarities could be physical, anatomical, like the arm, or it could be genetic, such as similar genes shared among organisms. Dr. McCarthy takes these arguments and, in all seriousness, uses the exact same arguments used to promote evolutionism to propone that the combination of similarities between chimps and humans and humans and pigs is good evidence that we are descended from a hot and steamy date between an ancient pig and chimp. If we suppose standard evolutionary theory to be correct, it would seem most peculiar that pigs and humans share features that distinguish human beings from chimpanzees, but that pigs and chimpanzees should not. Conventional theory, which assumes that pigs are equally as far removed from humans as from chimpanzees, says that pigs and chimpanzees would share about as many such traits as would pigs and humans. And yet, I have never been able to identify any such trait, despite assiduous investigation. The actual finding is that traits distinguishing chimpanzees from humans consistently links pigs with humans alone. It will be difficult to account in terms of natural selection for this fact. Indeed, if homology is a valid argument for evolutionism in any form, then he's made a convincing argument, requiring detractors to either accept his premise or reject homology altogether as an argument for evolution. In fact, he has many similar points on his website, macroevolution.net. Now, his theory has, understandably, garnered a lot of heat from the evolutionary community, but the reality is, he is effectively using evolutionary arguments and building a very compelling case. You can't have your cake and eat it too. Are those arguments for evolutionism valid 
or not. If they are valid, then McCarthy's explanation for the origin of our species is just as valid as any other evolutionary theory. However, as we pointed out on this show previously, it's pretty simple. Homology has nothing to do with evolution and the origin of species. The reason that pigs, humans, and chimps have similarities is because they were all created by the same common designer. This explains any form of homology, from the anatomical to the genetic. In fact, when it comes to things like convergent evolution, the common designer argument is a far more believable one. Convergent evolution is where, somehow, evolution magically produced the exact same features in completely different classes of organisms, and even using the same genes, sonar in bats and whales, for example. Even according to evolutionism, these organisms did not have a common ancestor with sonar. So they had to each go through the research and development process completely on their own and somehow arrived at the incredible similar systems and genes to do so. Now it's far more believable that they were both designed by the same creator and so he just did in one what he did in the other. It's simple, really. You'll recall on several previous episodes, we've detailed the repeated stunning finds of soft tissues found preserved in fossils. Now, the most famous of these was by Dr. Mary Schweitzer, who documented the T-Rex blood and even soft, stretchy tissues from the inside of a fossil T-Rex bone in Montana. Now, basically, T-Rex meat that you could still pull and it would stretch back into its original shape blood cells still preserved in blood vessels. Now, as we pointed out here previously though, while this was the most well-known and famous example, it is certainly not the only one. Dinosaur blood found in fossil dinosaur bones was documented back in the 1920s, and there has been many instances of both blood vessels, blood cells, and soft tissues found over decades. One of the more recent reports coming from Dr. Kevin Anderson and Mark Armitage finding blood cells and soft tissues in the horn of a triceratops. Now, when Dr. Schweitzer publicized the T-Rex blood cells and soft tissues, she openly admitted that she had absolutely no explanation how these cells and soft tissues could have remained preserved for 70 million years. Well, the real explanation is because it didn't survive 70 million years because it isn't 70 million years old. The answer is, of course, unacceptable to evolutionism. Evolutionism demands that these dinosaurs be many tens of millions of years old. Therefore, evolutionary scientists must find a method to preserve these cells and tissues for tens of millions of years in spite of the fact that decades of forensic research and studies of biological decay rates say it is absolutely impossible. In fact, these studies are so thorough and the science so solid that it stands up in a court of law. People are jailed and executed on this evidence. Such sciences say it is absolutely impossible for soft tissues and blood cells to remain preserved for millions of years. End of discussion. This past week, Schweitzer and team published a paper in the Proceedings of the Royal Society B, attempting to explain how the impossible happened. How blood cells and soft tissues could remain preserved for 70 million years. Suspecting that perhaps iron could act as a preservative, they soaked ostrich tissues in an iron-rich liquid which was essentially blood. It was hemoglobin-rich. They also soaked ostrich tissues in distilled water. The tissues soaked in water became badly decomposed within three days, but the tissues soaked in hemoglobin remained relatively intact for two years. So from this, Schweitzer and the team took a quantum leap to suggest that perhaps iron was acting like a preservative, and thus we have a possible explanation for soft tissues being preserved for millions of years. But does this really solve the problem? Now notice again, the problem is man-made. If you just follow the evidence where it leads, 
one would simply conclude that the dinosaurs were not 70 million years old. So what's the problem? Instead, because man-made evolutionism demands deep time, and evolutionism requires an old age of the dinosaurs, then the only problem is that of evolutionism, a man-made ideology, and it falters again. As a result, evolutionism and deep time are never questioned, like they should be if proper scientific procedure is followed. Instead, the actual scientific conclusions reached by decades of scientific deduction and observation, forensic studies, that say the dinosaurs must be young, those forensic studies must instead be questioned. Now, there's no nice way to say this. That is religious adherence to a blind faith and not science. Notice what has happened here. Evolutionism is not following the evidence where it leads. This is a classic example of how evolutionism is not scientific at all. Every single scientific study ever conducted shows that blood cells and soft tissues cannot be preserved for millions of years. They decay far too fast. Corollary scientific data also affirms that the dinosaurs are young, such as the finding of loads of carbon-14 in the dinosaur bones and in wood found in the same layer as the dinosaurs. Carbon-14 should not be there at all if it was any older than 100,000 years absolute maximum. Instead, carbon-14 dates all show the dinosaur bones as having an age somewhere between a few thousand to at most a few tens of thousands of years old. Human and dinosaur footprints found together show that humans and dinosaurs lived at the same time, which even prominent evolutionists have admitted in print would indicate the Earth and the dinosaurs were young, probably only a few thousand years old. A bed of dinosaur bones found in Alaska were fresh, so fresh that they were misidentified as old bison bones for 20 years. The evolutionists themselves would not say that Alaska was frozen all that time. So again, how do you preserve fresh bone for 70 million years? The short answer is you cannot, and they did not. The bones are recent. Well, let's not let facts ruin a perfectly good theory, and let's do exactly what so many anti-creationists are doing. Let's ignore all of these facts. What has Schweitzer and her team really shown? They've shown that soft tissues can be preserved for two years. <laughs> so what? <laughs> Obviously, Schweitzer and her team are not suggesting that the T-Rex bones remained bathed in blood for 70 million years which is basically what they did with their ostrich samples for two years. The experiment, I'm sorry, is completely irrelevant. The fact that soft tissues can be preserved in unusual circumstances is well known. This is old news. We have fantastic examples of preservation that we know are considerably older than two years, such as the bog people of Denmark. When Tolun Man was first dug up by workers working the peat bog, they actually called the police because they assumed they had found a murder victim. It was later deduced that the body was over 2,000 years old. And look at the remarkable preservation. King Tutankhamun's body is believed to be some 3,300 years old. And yet it also has plenty of preserved tissues. Now these are highly unusual circumstances. Whereas the dinosaur soft tissues and preserved blood, as we are finding out, are probably far more common than has been realized. Even Schweitzer herself acknowledged this in an interview with Stephanie Pappas at Live Science, saying, The problem is, for 300 years we thought, well, the organics are all gone, so why should we look for something that's not going to be there? And nobody looks. The Creation Research Society, sending a small group of researchers with very limited budget, went looking to see just how frequent such findings of soft tissues in blood cells in dinosaur bones were. They struck the proverbial gold on their first try, and two of the researchers published the results in Geochemica Acta Histochemica last year, showing the copious blood cells and preserved soft tissues in a triceratops horn from Montana. This is what happens when people actually look. 
So the Schweitzer team is implying that iron acts like, oh, almost formaldehyde, a preservative. And so if soft tissues can be preserved for two years, then it could survive for 70 million years. Two years is 0.000000028% of 70 million years. Even King Tutankhamun's corpse is 0.000047% of 70 million years. Well, let's put it to you this way. Tutankhamun's corpse is 3,300 years old. Do you think there will be anything left of that corpse in another 3,300 years? Maybe. What about another 3,300 years after that? Still think there will be some material, eh? What about another 3,300 years? And then another 3,300 years. And then another 3,300 years, etc. Even keeping Tutankhamun's corpse bathed in formaldehyde in a big glass jar would not keep it from disintegrating into dirt because you would have to preserve his skeleton for another 3,300 years over 21,000 times in order to get up to the 70 million year old age. Now, while Schweitzer and her team have conducted some very interesting research, this isn't even close to an explanation for soft tissues and blood cells being preserved for 70 million years. Instead, it has only gone to show just how impossible such a thing would be. Anyone in the know recognizes that everything about the dinosaurs shows that they were buried in a flood. When you examine the scale of the deposits, it's easy to recognize that it was the scale of a worldwide flood. Everything about the dinosaurs shows that they were killed in a flood of literally global proportions and probably within the past several thousand years, not millions of years ago. This all perfectly fits in line with the biblical account of a recent young creation and a worldwide flood. While the evolutionary scenarios disintegrate under even light scrutiny, just as bad as the dinosaur remains would if they were actually 70 million years old. Smithsonian posted in their surprising science blog with the provocative question, could this be the oldest flowering plant ever found in North America? Maryland PhD student Nathan Judd was wading through the Smithsonian fossil collections when he stumbled upon the fossil leaves of a variety of poppy. Now, it's in a rock dated by evolutionism as 115 to 125 million years old, at a time when evolutionism would say only very primitive flowering plants had evolved. Well, the plant would be considered anything but primitive. But what's interesting is that the idea of flower evolution has been turned over repeatedly for decades. And it seems no one has noticed. ICR's Acts and Facts had an excellent article out this month discussing pollen from flowering plants and evolution. Pointing to a recent paper in the journal Frontiers of Plant Science, they point to this new find of fossil pollen from Triassic rocks in Switzerland. Rocks that, according to evolutionism, are 243 million years old. About 110 million years before flowering plants are supposed to have evolved. And these pollen spores were from flowering plants considered quite advanced by evolutionary standards. Now, it's interesting to note that the researchers actually fall into circular arguing, noting that any fossil evidence of these plants is missing from the next 100 million years of rock record. Well, this results in them classifying these pollen spores as something other than what they are, angiosperms. Now, as we have noted on this show before many times, and in particular, episode 37 of season two, Fossil Record Busted, absence of the fossil from the rock does not mean the organism was absent when the rock was made. We note several organisms, such as the coelacanth, which vanishes from the fossil record for an alleged 75 million years, yet it's still around, quite alive and well today. But the Triassic pollens are old news. Fossil pollens have been found in Triassic rocks and even rocks considered evolutionarily older than that, and they've been found for decades. Hochuli and Feist Burkhardt mentioned several papers on such finds. But once again, the creationary community, definitely a more minority in the scientific community, 
was way ahead of the game. Why? Because evolutionism would say that there were no flowering plants before the Cretaceous. So no one would go and look to see if there was any. Evolutionism is a science stopper. The creationary community went and actually looked to see if there was any in proper scientific inquiry. Well, what do you know? They found some. In fact, they found lots. In fact, some were found in the rocks of Grand Canyon from the Permian right through to the Precambrian. The Hakatai Shale has been given an evolutionary age of 1.2 billion years old, and yet pollens were found in those rocks. This evidence is all in stark contradiction to evolutionary predictions and instead shows that, exactly as the Bible says, plants of all kinds have been around since the beginning of time. Grasses and rice are considered a type of angiosperm as they produce flowers. Well, before 2005, evolutionary scenarios would have said that the dinosaurs did not eat grasses because grasses had not yet evolved. But in that fateful year, fossilized grass remains were found in fossil dinosaur droppings. And in 2011, the same team found fossils of rice associated with the sauropods. Well, in Job chapter 40, we see God describing the behemoth, clearly a large dinosaur, with God describing the animal as eating grass like an ox. Well, only a few years ago, we would have been told by evolutionism that such a scenario was not true. As it turns out, the Bible painted the correct picture, and evolutionism was wrong again. Well, if the Bible is correct about the past, maybe, just maybe, it's right about the future. Previously, we had asked your opinion about whether or not you wanted to see a sneak peek of a scene from Mystery of Noah's Flood. It was unanimous that you all wanted to see it, so we're posting it on the mysteryofnoahsflood.com website, but to see it, you have to pay for it with a tweet. To be able to see the sneak peek, you'll have to like it on Facebook, tweet it on Twitter, plus it on Google, or a link to it on LinkedIn. Just head on over to mysteryknowasflood.com. You'll get to choose your option. Stick around. We'll be right back in just a minute. The Complete Creation video series is just that, an exhaustive look at the science, philosophy, and theology behind the creation-evolution debate. In this 12 DVD series, Ian Juby starts off with a one-hour presentation for the children in God's Little Creation. He then follows up with almost 11 hours of lecturing for the adults as he walks you through the debate starting at its surprising history and examining the evidence from biology, geology, physics, paleontology, and archaeology. Chances are any question you have about the creation-evolution debate is answered in this video series. With open captions for the hearing impaired, the series is both entertaining and educational. There are also free resources such as question and answer and proctor sheets for homeschoolers. You can now get the entire set as an instant digital download or on DVD. Visit Ian's Bookstore today. James Hunter sent us a tweet. Hey Ian, I have some friends that have seen your videos and they wonder why the flood uprooted trees and left egg beds alone. Now that is an excellent question. Thanks for writing in. Now for those not familiar, we find dinosaur egg nests intact, fossilized in the rock record. Now, as we discussed in recent shows, we find fossilized trees literally all over the world that have been ripped up and buried, often vertically, by water. So how did the water rip up trees, yet not disturb dinosaur egg nests? Now, to answer this question, I conducted experiments in our experimental flume at Creation Evidence Museum in Glen Rose, Texas. Now, unfortunately, I didn't have the video camera running for this particular experiment, and we had a failure in the wall of the flume just as I was running this last experiment on the morning we were leaving after two weeks of research. So I couldn't run the experiment again. 
However, anybody can reproduce these results for themselves. I took regular chicken eggs and placed them in the sand in the bottom of the flume in different orientations. I then ran water through the flume up to maximum velocity we had, we had available, which was about five meters per second. Now, while I expected the eggs to be very stable, even in fast flows, I was still surprised by what I saw. We were at the limits of our flume and the eggs not only stayed in place, unmovable, the sand was actually scoured by the water and deposited behind the eggs, buttressing them from even more from the water flows. Now, plants, on the other hand, behave very differently uh, in water flows for different reasons. Plants, for example, are buoyant. They float. Furthermore, I would say that the fossil trees we see ripped up were ripped up in the early stages of the flood, during the erosional stage, if you will, where the initial waves of Noah's flood scoured the land. Whereas the dinosaur eggs and nests were laid on tidal flats, much later in the flood, where incoming waves were depositing sediments more than eroding them. And it is during those times of deposition where trees which were previously ripped up and still being floated around by water eventually get grounded and then buried in the sediments as they are now being deposited. Now, don't forget, even in the same flood today, water velocities can vary wildly. It was no different during Noah's flood, as there were different stages to the flood, different influences and effects on the water at different times. Also bear in mind that other catastrophes were undoubtedly going on at the time of the flood as well. Mount St. Helens provided a modern day example of a volcanic explosion ripping up and leveling huge areas of forest. Spirit Lake was literally blasted up a mountainside by the explosion and when the water ran back down the mountainside, it scoured all the trees off the mountainside. So there are other processes which can uproot trees, after which a flood can also take over and then float those trees to distant areas. I hope that helps. Thanks for the excellent question. Well, we're out of time for this week. I'm your host, Ian Juby. Thanks for watching. We realize there's a lot of competition for your viewership, and we're grateful that you chose to watch Genesis Week. I hope you'll join me again next week. Remember, you can send in your comments, questions, and Nigerian email scams to us in a number of ways. Remember those words of warning from our Creator, the Lord Jesus Christ, who said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father except through me. We'll see you next week. We are a viewer-supported program and need your support to keep this program on the air. Please pray for us, and if you wish to financially support the program, Canadians can make a tax-deductible donation to CORE Ottawa, Canada North Post Office Box 72075, Ottawa, Ontario, K2K, 2P4. While we cannot offer tax-deductible receipts outside of Canada, donors wishing to financially support the program can do so online at ianjuby.org slash donations. And thank you for your support.